Hi folks, uh, welcome to uh, what I'm calling the end of Module 1. Um, according to our syllabus, we have the first three weeks to sort of get an understanding of what's going on in this course, the material course. And of course, you guys have really re realized that the first two weeks and maybe two and a half weeks were primarily looking at how different materials behave, or at least, um, at least how we can test how different materials behave. And what we need to do now is we sort of need to start looking into the idea of why material behaves the way that it does and how we can go about classifying different materials into different groups so that when we start building things we can you know reach into a bucket and get something that's stiff or reach into a bucket or get something that's that's soft um, it pays us to um, to figure out you know what are the materials around us and what we can do to improve them or to uh, to change their properties uh, what's kind of cool about this um, materials framework, as I've, I've, I've uh, titled it, is it sort of um, is a hodgepodge of different ideas, but what it does is it sort of summarizes the entirety of chemistry into one little tiny talk, which is kind of cool. It's not something that I've created or I've done. It's just that um, if you look at it from a materials point of view, you can really cover all the different types of materials or all the different types and classes of, of materials um, in one little sitting or one little um, one little review and you can really understand of why they do what they do if you get the fundamental chemistry behind them which is which is kinda cool as you guys know I'm a I'm a chemistry major uh, also a physics major but a chemistry major and after a while of studying all the details of all the chemistries um, different types of chemistry you sort of get a knack of hey wait a minute a lot of these things have things in common and if you look at all the commonalities and look at the things that are that are just different and separate them, you find out pretty quickly that it's a pretty simple and uncomplicated story and it allows you to get a good handle of what's going on before you dive into all the details. So let me press um, press our button here and switch over to the Prezi. So we always start um, talking about um, a big topic like materials using a framework. You already have seen the ISBIT framework. The ISBIT framework is definitely based on the idea of a system with inputs and processes and outputs and then the environment. And then we connect these things together. So we, we have a similar framework for our materials. And again, it's this materials that we can, this framework that we can use to hang the different materials off of. You can think of it as a framework, like a trellis for a plant that grows up outside. Or you can think of it as scaffolding, perhaps. Um, scaffolding that you would use to build something large, like a cathedral. And then you take the scaffolding away and then you, um, you know, marvel at what you have. So let's go through some of these topics. Um, so what we've already mentioned um, that what we're studying this semester is stuff. Um, we've already studied energy in the physics class, ISBIT 112. And we've already studied information, measurement and instrumentation um, in ISBIT uh, 211. And in ISBIT 212, we're studying materials or stuff. So typically, materials is the hard stuff. It could be soft, of course, but the material stuff, the, thi the stuff that you can grab, not concepts, not energy, not information like a Tuesday or the name of a color, that's information, but stuff that you can tangibly grab and move around and build things out of, of course, that's what stuff is. So we have already learned that the science of stuff and, and how the stuff behaves and how these, uh, this different stuff reacts is the science of chemistry. And um, we've already know from high school and maybe even before high school that if we look at all the different flavors of stuff, they come, they come in three different or three major phases. And of course, we just want to review the vocabulary and make sure we're there. So the three major fla flavors or phases of stuff are stuff that are currently in a gas form, stuff that is currently in a liquid form, and stuff that is usually in, that is all, uh, currently in a solid form. And as you can see here, gas, the individual pieces of the stuff, the individual components that make the stuff the stuff. I'll stop saying stuff in a little bit. Um, they bounce off of each other. That's a gas. If they slide next to each other, we usually call that a fluid or in this case a liquid. And if they're stuck to each other, we call it a solid. So we're definitely going to be talking about different gases and different liquids this semester. But primarily when we're talking about materials this semester, we're going to be talking about solid stuff. Um, all the things we've mentioned before, metals, 
polymers, elastomers, um, ceramics, and glass. All of those guys, of course, have different phases. You can have liquid metal, um, you know, molten iron and the like, but primarily we're talking about when it's a solid phase. So in the laboratory, and especially in um, sort of general chemistry laboratories and especially in the bio laboratories, we usually use a lot of liquids because that's a, an easy way to measure things. It's very difficult to, to you know, spend the entire day in the laboratory pounding rocks and uh, dealing with the solid form of different chemicals. Usually we, they mix and react much better when they're in a liquid or a gaseous phase. But for our class, we're going to be using mostly solid stuff. Okay, So those are our three major things. Now, chemistry itself comes in different flavors. Um, it's a big topic, obviously. Stuff is a very large topic. So we have different flavors of scientists, in this case, different flavors of chemists that study different areas of the stuff sort of, um, sort of collection. When it comes to pure gases and mixtures of gases um, and how they react and how they bounce off of each other and the idea of how they absorb energy and release energy, that's a really broad term and a broad way to, to brush it. But I'm going to call that physical chemistry. So you see right away the root word physics is in here. We're going to see how these pure gases of, say, hydrogen and helium and gases um, do bounce around as if they were little tiny um, balls bouncing off of each other. That sounds like a physics question, and that's what we call physical chemistry. Right below that, we're talking about the type of chemicals and chemistry that we'll see in our environment, our earthly environment, um, mostly talking about the air that we breathe and the water that we drink and swim in. So liquid water, liquid-based solutions of stuff is usually the purview or the intention of the environmental chemist. If you're specifically talking about life forms, um, we, uh, as life forms, use a lot of biopolymers. We're going to find out in a little bit what the biopolymers are. And those biopolymers are primarily uh, made out of chemicals that are, are um, molecules of carbon and carbon and hydrogen are hydrocarbons. Um, so it's very, very important. Hydrocarbons is the chemistry of us. Hydrocarbons is the chemistry of the food that we eat. Um, so it gets in a really, really large area of chemistry called organic chemistry. And if you've taken chemistry classes or have seen or, or know chemistry majors, typically they'll take an entire year or two semesters of organic chemistry. It's a really large area in chemistry. Um, and then I mentioned about life sciences, specifically talking about those chemicals, those organic chemicals that are used inside the life sciences. We're going to call that biochemistry. And we have a biochemistry major here at LaSalle. So carbon and hydrocarbon mixtures, specifically those used by living systems as opposed to just um, happening to be hydrocarbons. Carbon sounds like uh, only one element. We have about 112, 118, depending on what version of the, of the periodic table you're looking at, over 100 different atoms, 100 different elements. Um, carbon's just one of them. Then we have organic chemistry and biochemistry. But if, you're not, if the chemical is not primarily carbon, um, then it's called inorganic chemistry. And as you've known, if you've talked to, talk to uh, Dr. Jones for much time, you know that her PhD is in inorganic chemistry. He's a, she's a chemist that studies, um, in addition to carbon, but also specializes in the other, the other chemicals, uh, the other uh, atoms on the periodic table that aren't carbon. And then, of course, um, you guys have had me before. If you haven't had me before, uh, my PhD is in analytical chemistry. Um, we, of course, as an analytical chemist, study all those things that we just mentioned, but specifically, we study different ways to identify and measure the different amounts and the different identifications of non-carbon mixtures and carbon mixtures, and that's analytical chemistry. And then way down here at the bottom, if we're studying about the properties of stuff, not so much all the things we just saw before, specifically, in or, specifically inorganic chemistry, the reactions, and uh, biochemistry, the reactions of chemicals in the life sciences. If you're particularly talking about the, the, the properties of stuff for the purpose of using them and building things out of them, um, usually we're going to call that material science. So not specifically a chemistry per se, but um, they go ahead and call it material science as opposed to just chemistry. So the different types of materials that we're going to, to study this semester, we've already seen this in our overview. Um, we're going to study iron-based metals. 
Oh, by the way, the very old Latin name for iron uh, was ferium. That was what I, I wasn't around. It was called ferium. So we keep that old Latin word ferium and a different versions of it. The adjective is ferrous. We have ferrous, we have ferric, depending on different, um, different ionic charges. But these are called ferrous metals or metals that happen to be based on iron. We have other metals that have nothing to do with iron, meaning they have no iron in them. Um, th because iron is so important, the Iron Age and steel and other things we've worked with, um, they get an entire category to themselves called non-ferrous metals. So this is sort of like organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry. Now we have ferrous metals and non-ferrous metals, and we'll see that what's, what they are in a few minutes. Um, if we move over to carbon-based uh, molecules, we get polymers and elastomers. If we move over to silicon, primarily silicon-based um, um, molecules, we get ceramics and glass. If we layer these things or we mix groups of metals, polymers, and ceramics, we get composites. And then we can spe specifically look at materials that are sticky and stick to each other. Um, and those are adhesives and coatings. Obviously, when it comes to adhesives, you'd like the glue to stick to the things you're gluing together. And when you stick paint on a wall, you want the paint to stick to the wall. You don't want it to fall down by gravity and be a puddle on the floor. And then we have specific metals that are reactive and slippery. Um, we'll find out why, why you need reactivity and why they should be slippy or slippery. And those are called fuels and lubricants. So those are the things we'll be studying um, once we get past you know, the mechanical properties of compression and tension and all blah, 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 all those things. So when it comes to materials technology, what are we going to be studying um, for each of these individual metals? So these are the four things that we need whenever we talk about a material, a stuff. One is a specification. We need to specify what we're looking for. What do we need? How strong should it be? How light should it be? How shiny should it be? How conductive should it be? On and on and on and on. We need a specification. Once we have a specification telling us what we're looking for, we need to know what the properties are of the material are to see if those are the ones that, were, that, that fit. Again, how shiny is it? How soft is it? How hard is it? How conductive is it? Those are the properties that we need to measure. So we need to specify what we're looking for. We need to know the properties of the things we can choose from. And then we need to pick it. Okay, We're going to use wood for this part. We're going to use aluminum for this part. We're going to use cement for this part. We need to specify uh, which we're going to actually use. And then rounding this out, after we go ahead and specify what we're looking for, familiarize ourselves with the properties of their choices, pick one or a few to experiment with, we need to test them. We need to see whether we we're right or not. And that's sort of what we started out this semester talking about was testing. How do we test for compressive strength? How do we test for shear strength or flexure? And then we saw all kinds of testing on those videos like testing aircraft engines and crash testing cars. <coughs> Pardon me. So when it comes to what is a material made out of? What is the stuff? Of course, we all realize because we've been studying chemistry for a while, we've been studying science for a while, and materials for a while in other schools, high school, and other courses. Um, when we look at stuff, stuff is usually comprised of smaller stuff. That doesn't make sense. Um, sort of like looking at a giant Lego Star, Star Wars battleship. We know that a giant Lego Star Wars battleship is actually composed of smaller little tiny Lego bricks. Now it's very difficult to pull apart the individual Lego bricks. It's possible with a tool or maybe a pair of pliers, but not with your hands. You're not going to take apart a red Lego brick with your hands. It's really a tough little, little element. Well, that's what we have here. We're going to be able to take apart our materials, you know, maybe with some tools, but eventually we're going to get down to the smallest pieces possible. Not the subatomic particles like protons and neutrons and electrons. We'll get to those, but we're going to get to the smallest part that still makes it um, whatever it is. So if you've studied this before, you know the smallest you can get and still be a certain compound or a certain element, and that is element, a certain thing like gold or hydrogen 
or copper. You can't get much smaller than copper. Once you start breaking apart copper, then you start breaking apart the nucleus and the electrons and the neutrons of the atom, and you start fragmenting it into subatomic particle physics. We're going to stay at chemistry. So if we take an element, which is a, 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 those abbreviations on the periodic table of the elements, it's a collection of the same type of, of atoms. A compound is going to be a collection of two or more atoms that are actually connected or bound to each other. The compound can be the same atom or it can be different atoms. So, so diatomic helium, H2, is a compound, even though it's made only of helium. And then, of course, we can have a mixture, a collection of two or more elements and our compounds mixed together in the same container that may or may not be chemically snapped together. They just happen to be in the same container at the same time. That's a mixture. And if we've, we've done several experiments with these things, it's very easy. I, I guess easy is a bad word. It Usually we can find a way to separate a mixture. It's very difficult to separate a compound unless you use chemistry. And it's really difficult to separate an element unless you use, use high particle physics to do that. So element compound mixture, not new terms, but something that we want to familiarize ourselves with. Once we break things down to an atom, then of course we get into the individual subatomic particles, protons, charge positive one, neutrons, charge zero, electrons, charge negative one. And we know from studying these things, protons and neutrons are in the nucleus of an atom, and electrons sort of fly around or exist in the outer orbit um, of, the, um, of the nucleus. Okay? So this is a picture. This is definitely a cartoon. Um, there are different ways to visualize electrons sort of flying around. They don't fly around in disks like the rings of Saturn. Elect you can visualize them as sort of uh, flying around like a shell, like an egg. Um, the way I visualize it is sort of like the surface of a balloon. Um, uh, I, I see the charge of a single electron, that plus one charge, being distributed over the entire skin of a three-dimensional balloon. And you can squish that balloon, and you can pop that balloon, you can blow up the balloon, make it larger, you can shrink the balloon, make it smaller. But that's sort of I sort of um, visualize it after being chem a chemist for a while that each of these individual electron orbits is actually a film or a skin, either a, a balloon or a bubble, like a soap bubble. In this example, um, we have nitrogen. This is the cartoon of nitrogen. Nitrogen has seven protons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, in yellow. Seven neutrons in orange, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They're all there accounted for. And there's seven electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And again, these things are sort of randomly pictured in this cartoon. It's just a cartoon. But you'll notice that there's two electrons that are closer. And again, with this film thing, I visualize this as being a smaller bubble or a smaller balloon. And then out here, there happens to be um, two larger orbits. Um, two of them happen to be in this s2 orbit, and three of them happen to be in the 2p orbit. So one, two, three in this outer, outer shell two in this outer inner shell, and two in this inner inner shell. I know I sound stupid by saying that. It just happens to be a cartoon of how we do that. What we're really looking forward to is the center has positives and neutrons, and the outer has negatives. This just happens to be a cartoon of what a, a nitrogen atom looks like. If we start removing electrons from a nitrogen, what we get is a nitrogen ad, uh, ion but it's still nitrogen. What determines the nitrogen is how many plus protons are inside here. If we start removing neutrons or adding neutrons, we get an isotope of nitrogen, but it's still nitrogen. If we pop off a proton, then we get a six proton element, and I believe that's carbon. Uh, so all of a sudden we change it to a different animal altogether. We stop being nitrogen and start being carbon if we start popping off protons. It's very difficult to pop off a proton unless you're in a, a very, very exotic machine. So here it is. Here's the glory. Um, this particular version has 111 um, known um, um, elements in the periodic table of the elements. And notice these guys down in this particular version of this graphic, um, element 110 and 111 were not named yet. They may be named now. 
And of course, we've seen this before. There are different periods. There are different um, rows here. There are different abbreviations for the name. And there's also different colors. There's sort of this cyan blue color. There's this gold or yellow color. And then there's this, um, this pink or fuchsia color over here. Okay, And we're going to see in a minute why periodic tables have these different colors. But this is where we're at. Okay, and each of these guys happens to have an abbreviation. If you've spent much time with periodic table, then you know what they are. I think that's hydrogen. I think that's helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon. I'm a chemist. I have a PhD in chemistry. I can assure you, I don't know all the periodic tables of the element. It's just something to memorize. Um, if you happen to be working with lots of metals like vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, and gallium, um, then you sort of memorize them because they, they're stuck in your head. We're not going to ask anybody to memorize this for the sake of memorizing it. It's not what we do. Um, but as we go for, through here, what we want to do is we want to start building up those compounds. We can just have the metal itself running around with one, you know, I said metal, the atom itself um, just be one atom, but they're more fun when they start hooking up with other atoms, okay? I just, uh, yeah, I just did say that. Um, when two atoms bond, it's their electrons that interact, okay? So let me pull back here real quick. Um, for two atoms to bond, say for instance nitrogen, we take one nitrogen in this entire system and copy it over here and notice the closest, if I were to draw another one over here, the closest they can get is to have their electron shells bump into each other. This is not to scale. The distance between these protons in the nucleus and these electrons um, in the uh, the outer shell is really, really huge. I think, I, I forget the actual analogy, I think if an electron was the size of a penny, I believe the first electron would be at like the 90 yard line and these nucleus would be in the end zone. That's how much space there is. So these, another nitrogen interacting with this nitrogen can only interact by bouncing into or interacting with its electron shells. The protons and the protons and the neutrons and the neutrons do not interact. It's just the outer electrons that interact. Okay? So we, here's the simple story. We have two primary ways for these atoms to interact. Again, their electrons are interacting. Two things can happen. I guess one thing can happen. A third thing where nothing happens, but typically it's one or the other. Okay? The first one is that one of the two atoms donates an electron. Okay? It turns out that one of the atoms has an electron to spare, and one of the electrons over here, uh, one of the atoms over here has an electron that it might like to have. I'm not talking about well, we, it could be an ionic reaction where it gives it away, but metals, which I've designated here as an M, tend to give up their electrons. Here, have this. Uh, it's an extra. I don't need it. Okay. Um, so that's one type of interaction for these elements. Some elements behave like that, where they give up electrons. And oh, by the way, in material science, just like well, I'm sorry about that. Uh, yes, I know it's full screen. Sorry about that. Um, now that we know that polymers, we call them plastic because they like to bend. Metals, um, we call them metals because they like to donate their electrons. Acting like a metal means that you donate an electron, not that you're a metal like silver. So metals donate electrons. It just happens to be what it is. Oh, by the way, if you don't donate an electron, but you tend to accept an electron or gain an electron, that's the opposite, we call them nonmetals. I wasn't there when they named them, um, so that we have to live with it. Metals donate, nonmetals accept. That's, that's all there is. There, there's two types. There's metals donate, there's nonmetals accept. So let's take a tour. Oh, by the way, if we go back to our lovely colored periodic table of the elements. All of the elements that are in cyan, this lovely color of light blue, they're all metals. What makes them a metal? When you take hydrogen and you convince it or give it an opportunity or cause it to react with any one of these other elements, it happens to donate an electron. It behaves like a metal. Okay. Same with all these guys down here. Now, 
are metals in this area things that we normally think of as being metals, like gold. Gold is AG, uh, AU. Silver, AG. Mercury, um, platinum, nickel, copper, um, cobalt, iron, manganese, chromium. Yeah, they're all metals, and they happen to be metals as a stuff. Go grab me that copper wire. But they're also, from an element perspective, metals because they give up electrons. Okay, They're the cyan ones. The nonmetals, <coughs> pardon me, elements that tend to accept electrons, they're the pink or the future elements over here. Notice there's a big difference. We didn't design it, we found it. This is how we discovered um, the universe to be. Of the metals that we know about, the majority of the metals happen to or all of the metals happen to represent a majority of the elements we know about there's a heck of a lot of cyan colored elements over here that are metals there's only a few fuchsia or pink colored elements over here that are non-metals it just is what it is so if these all these guys on this side of the periodic table happen to be metals and all of these guys over here happen to be non-metals these guys donate these guys accept what happens to the elements that are right along the middle? They're in the no man's land, of course. So what are we going to call them? We're going to call them semi-metals. Um, the semi-metals sometimes, not 50-50, yeah, maybe it's 50-50, I don't know. Um, sometimes in certain reactions, they donate electrons and act like metals. And sometimes they accept electrons and act like non-metals. So all these guys through here, the boron, the silicon, uh, all these guys, the germanium, the arsenic, antimony, tellurium, they all are semi-metals. And you'll notice pretty quickly they're also semi-conductors when we talk about conduction. Um, so those are our big three. How did we get three from two primary types? Because this is a very huge pattern. We have two primary types, those that donate and those who accept and those that do both. That's three categories, okay? If we get this, we understand the entire class. Metals, donate, that's type one. Non-metals, accept, that's type two. Semi-metals go both ways. Um, sometimes accept, sometimes donate. That gives us a third pretend category, if you will. So out of two comes three. Okay, so what about our possible combinations? How do we go about reacting these elements together? Okay, so let's take a look at it. Let's start off with what if I react one metal with another metal? It can be the exact same element, a copper and a copper, or it could be two different metals, a copper and a nickel, whatever. A copper and a copper, a copper and a nickel, a metal with a metal. What happens? Well, remember, um, oh, I'm sorry, we're not there yet. So these are the possible combinations. We have a metal and a metal reacting together. That's one combination, back to this pattern of three again. Non-metal and non-metal. Again, nitrogen and nitrogen. That's a non-metal with a non-metal. Um, that's type number two. And then we have a metal with a non-metal or a non-metal with a metal, right? That's the four combinations. Metal with metal non-metal with non-metal and metal with non-metal non-metal that is four however these guys are the same thing right doesn't matter who goes first metal plus a non-metal or metal plus a non-metal reading back is still the same thing so we're back to this idea of three again metals with metals is one type non-metals with non-metals is a separate type and a metal and a non-metal combined is the third type big three here comes our three this is why i love three so much okay now we get to describe what goes on a metal with a metal, copper with copper, copper with nickel, copper with palladium, whatever you want. Metal and a metal, what's happening? This metal on the left would like to donate its electron to the metal on the right. At the same time, the metal on the right would like to donate its electron to the metal on the left. What happens is we get this dynamic little cycle. Okay. Notice that these guys are not ions. We don't have extra electrons here. We just happen to have our regular electrons. It just so happens that metals who have their normal amount of electrons would prefer to ditch one, two, three electrons and even go um, 
positive because they've lost an electron, um, then stay neutral when they're bonding. It just happens to be what they are. So this metal on the left-hand side pushes, if you will, its electrons to the metal on the right. This metal pushes its electron to the metal on the left. But because it does it so quickly, the transaction between this metal and this metal actually makes a connection. They're connected by these stupid lines, okay? While this metal is in the process of handing off the electron to this metal, they're in contact. They're in interaction. While this metal is in the process of handing back the same electron or a different electron, they're in contact. What happens is they actually form a bond. The bond is this electrons moving back and forth really, really quick. There's electrons in the middle. Remember, electrons are on the outside. But they're pushing. They're not pushing each other away as in um, you know, flying apart like the north and north pole of a magnet. It just means that the, the electrons are being pushed to each other. This rapid transfer of electrons back and forth by a push gets a special name. It's called, wait for it, metallic bonding. Okay, Again, bonding is when these atoms um, have an interaction between each other, and this interaction happens to be sharing electrons, when I say sharing, transferring electrons back and forth really, really rapidly. That's the first type. If you have a metal and a metal, they bond using metallic bonding. Metal and metal happens to be the easiest to remember because it uses the same damn word. Metal, metal, metallic. Fantastic. Typical metals. These are all solids. Iron. It's a metal. If you find pure iron, it's difficult to find pure iron. We're going to learn how you get iron out of the ground. Usually you don't find it like this. It's not how we get it out of the ground. There's iron. Again, it's a metal. It looks like a metal. Kind of shiny, kind of silvery in this case. This is what raw copper looks like. Oh, look. It's copper colored. That's why we call it copper. Um, nickel. It's nickel colored. Uh, the surface of the moon has a lot of nickel on it. That's why the surface of the moon looks like a silvery moon. It has nickel. It looks like, this, it looks like a, a five cent um, nickel because it has a, a shiny nickel coating on it. Gold. Gold is the color of gold. Okay, that's just that's what gold looks like. Silver is the color of silver. Looks very similar to iron and nickel. Uh, happens to be a silvery type metal. Aluminum looks like silver. Uh, there's aluminum all by itself. These are all metals. They're all shiny. They all sort of look metallic, and they're all held together by metallic bonding. So you can already get an idea. If someone picks up an aluminum bat or an aluminum rod, it's a pretty strong piece of material. Okay. <clears throat> so properties. Back to our properties of, uh, of being a metal. It's a good conductor of electricity. What's electricity? Electricity is taking electrons from one side of a wire and having them pop, hop, 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 hop to the other side of the wire and then spit out the other side. Metals do that in spades. If you give one metal an extra electron and it likes to donate metals in the first place, it's going to pass it along really, really quickly. Metals happen to be really fantastic um, conductors of electricity. Oh, by the way, they also have to be very good good conductors of heat. We studied heat before. We've studied temperature before. We know heat and temperature usually means movement, lots of movement, fast shaking, fast movement of molecules. As electrons are good conductors um, through electric, electric wires, they're also very, very good conductors of heat. The electrons can take heat away. Metals also happen to be malleable and ductile. Again, you could also possibly use the word plastic, but people get confused. Uh, an iron bar, people wouldn't say, hey, can you hand me that plastic iron bar? If you have enough force and use a large enough robot or a large enough bulldozer, you can twist an iron bar as easily as you can twist a copper wire. Uh, malleable and ductile, as we saw before, they're shiny. They can be very lightweight, like aluminum. They can be very heavy, like iron. Um, Low melting point to moderately higher melting point. We'll be studying melting points later, but these are some of the metal, these are some of the, the properties of metals. Okay? They all share the same properties because they're all metal atoms bonded with metal atoms that are pushing electrons back and forth. Okay? Let's go to our next class. A nonmetal bonding with a nonmetal. Nitrogen to nitrogen. That's an example. Okay? 
same or similar interaction. An electron goes from one nonmetal to the other, but if you remember, nonmetals accept. So what happens is this model sort of reaches out and pulls this electron away, and this nonmetal reaches out and pulls this nonmetal away. So if you can imagine this happening simultaneously, this nonmetal says, hey, I want your electron. This nonmetal says, hey, I want your electron. When they're finished with the little shenanigans, there's no net change. No one's gotten positive. No one's gotten negative. It's just that you got mine, I got yours. Let's do it again. Okay. So they constantly sit there popping electrons back and forth, very similar to metallic bonding. But with metallic bonding, they were pushing them. I don't want it. It's like a hot potato. I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want it. With nonmetal and nonmetal, similar bonding but different force poor pull versus push i'll take yours no i'll take yours i'll take yours no i'll take yours rapidly share the electron back and forth we're going to call that covalent bonding this idea of sharing rather than pushing um, the other one was called metallic bonding between two metals this guy is called not non-metallic bonding it's called covalent bonding because the electrons in the outer shell are called the valence shell and those are the electrons that get shared or bounce back and forth. So we call it covalent because they share valence electrons. So when you cooperate, um, you do a task together. And when you covalent, valently bond, you um, share your valence electrons or valence electrons. So covalent bonding for nonmetal, nonmetal. Some examples. Well, that's where we get polymers and elastomers. They are covalently bonded. Some examples, um, little tiny plastic baggies, polyethylene. We'll study why it's called polyethylene and where it came from. That's the symbol, recycling symbol for polyethylene. Foamed polystyrene. Polystyrene is another polymer. Foamed polystyrene is what you get when you get a foam, uh, a styrofoam cup is foamed polystyrene. Um, rubber, this is isoprene, it's a rubber ducky. Um, it's also a polymer, also happens to be an elastomer. When you squeeze a rubber ducky and it squeaks, if it has a squeaker in it, it comes back where it was. You don't crush it. It's not an aluminum can where you squeeze it once and now your aluminum can is now squished. It's a rubber ducky, it's an elastomer, it squishes and comes back. So rubber ducky is also an example of a covalent material. Some properties. Sort of the opposite of metallic. Metallic bonding, they were pushing electrons. Covalent bonding, they're accepting or holding on to electrons. So they're good electric insulators. If you try to give a polymer or try to give a covalently bonded material an extra electron, it'll say, no, I'm good. I already have enough. It's not going to accept it. Okay. So it's a very good insulator. In much the same way that metals are are um, good conductors of both electricity and heat, polymers are good electric insulators of both electricity and heat. So good electric insulators. We saw malleability and ductility with metals. We see plasticity and elasticity with polymers and elastomers. Almost the same stuff. You can bend and squish a metal. You can bend and squish a polymer and elastomer. However, they bend and squish using different methods of bonding. One's metallic, pushing apart, and one's covalent, pulling together. Polymers and elastomers tend to be lightweight instead of a giant you know, lead brick, and they tend to have a low melting point. We'll see that in a little bit. Number two, right? Number three, our third style. Remember, we had three possible combinations. Metal, metal, metallic. Non-metal, non-metal, covalent. Now we have the third category. What if we mix a metal with a non-metal? Okay, that's what we have here. Well, remember, metals like to donate their electrons. Non-metals like to accept, okay? Donate, accept, thank you, done. The end. They're not bonded anymore by moving electrons back and forth. Hey, I have an electron I really want to get rid of. Hey, I'm looking for electrons. Transaction finished. As soon as the transaction happens, we're done. It doesn't go back. 
okay? We've lost an electron from the metal. We've gained an electron from to the nonmetal. Transfer electron permanently. What do we have left? We now have a metal that's missing an electron. If you were zero charge before, take away one negative, you're now positive. The metal is now a positive ion. The nonmetal was zero charge. It now has an elect extra electron. You are now negatively charged. You're now a negative uh, ion. Positive ion, negative ion, positive and negative attract. These two are now stuck together by virtue that this is a positive charge, this is a negative charge. It's called ionic bonding. We have a metal ion plus, a non-metal ion negative. They bond together permanently in ionic bonding. Here's, our, here's, here's the image of these brackets. A positive metal ion, a negative non-metal, positive and negative non-metal attract. They get as close as they can possibly get until they touch their electrons, and then they're stuck. There's no pulling them apart unless you crack them, okay? Ionic bonding. This is our third type. Metallic bonding, share the electron through pushing it back and forth. Covalent bonding, share the electron through pulling it back and forth. Ionic bonding, nothing being shared. Here you go. Thank you. Done. Oh, look, we're stuck. Okay, so what is this third class of materials that have a positive atom stuck to a negative atom? And what sort of, well, ceramics and glass. The primary components of these rocks are metals and nonmetals that are stuck together by positive and negative forces. You can imagine together, imagine they're very difficult to pull apart, which is why rocks are not squishy. Rocks are not malleable, rocks are not ductile, rocks are not plastic, and rocks are not elastic. They're rocks, okay? They're very hard and they're very brittle. You can crack them, and by cracking them you can rip apart the positive and negative attractive qualities, but you can't stretch them and you can't squish them, they're done. Now, when I know before that we squished the chalk a little bit, so these are really broad terms, but you're not turn you're not gonna unless you do the Flintstones, you're not gonna make a, a bed out of rock and then have a night a nice uh, a nice night's sleep on it. It's not gonna be very um very comfortable. So these are ionic compounds. Rock is one of them. Cinder block is one of them, not very soft, not very comfortable, not very twisty. It's gonna crack. Bricks are ceramics. Glass is ceramics. It's a picture of a, of a building with windows open on the side. Okay. Glass bottles, not very squishy. Okay. We have plastic bottles that we squeeze all the time. We have squeeze bottle ketchup, squeeze bottle mustard, squeeze bottle mayonnaise. We squeeze the plastic bottle to get the contacts out. Fantastic. We have aluminum cans. They're metals. The aluminum cans are, are not very thick, so they're easable to, easy to squeeze, but they're not elastic. They don't come back. Um, glass bottles, you're not squeezing them. You can break them. Watch out. You'll cut yourself. Very fragile. Glass bottles are also ionic. The metals and the nonmetals transfer electrons permanently. Pardon me. Ceramic properties. Excellent electric insulator. Okay, The electrons have already been transferred, and they're not going anywhere. Oh, by the way, it's sort of an odd surprise, and the scientists were just as surprised, believe me. There are some ceramics that have an amazingly special recipe and configuration that happen to be not an insulator, but so not an insulator that they're called superconductors. Okay, So you sort of get the extremes. You get the extreme of fantastic insulator and then in really really special recipes you get the extreme of fantastic conductor okay so our best superconductors are ceramics and when we study ceramics we'll find out why happens to be an extremely excellent heat insulator okay um, that's what we'll be talking about ceramics we'll be talking about brick homes we'll be talking about stone cathed cathedrals and why they're cool in the summer and warm in the winter because they're able to keep the heat in or keep the heat out we'll be talking about that later but now we're talking about ceramics which are ionic ionic bonded compounds 
this no is really, really strong. Um, we saw before when we were crushing our chalk, which is an ionic compound, we got a little bit of crush, a little bit of plasticity, a tiny little bit of elastic, but not much, especially not on a human scale. It started to crush really quick. So when I say no, I mean not on a human scale. You're not going to rest something on a giant rock and watch it squish in half. Not happening. Usually ceramics are very heavy. Rocks are heavy. Bricks are heavy. People talk about getting hit on the head by a ton of bricks, which is stupid because a ton of feathers weighs just as much. But heavy. High melting point. Remember that our plastics had extremely low melting points, our metals had moderate melting points, and our ionic compounds have extremely high melting points. Again, the big three. So the covalents that share, they stop sharing pretty quickly and they fall apart. Um, the, um, the metals, they have a medium um, a melting point, and the high melting point are the ionic compounds that are really held tightly together by all these forces. Okay. So here we go. We're back to the beginning again. Um, the reason why I wanted to go through this and take so much time to go through it is that this really is the basis of our framework for the rest of the course when we talk about metals, polymers and elastomers, and ceramics and glass. And then we talk about um, individual things like um, composites, adhesives and coatings, and fuels and lubes. The big three, the metals, the polymers, and the ceramics, are metals, ceramics, and polymers because of how their individual atoms bond. So metallic bonding is important, covalent bonding is important, and ionic bonding is important because it's those three different ways that bond that result in our three primary different types of materials. So when we study metals, which are up next, we're going to be studying metallic bonding at the same time, and every one of our metals that we look at is going to be an example of metallic bonding. And then when we get to polymers and, and elastomers, every one of those is an example. It's going to be an, a covalent bonding. And then when we get to ceramics and glass, every one of those is going to be an example of ionic bonding. But if you get those three down, metals donate electrons, nonmetals accept electrons, and with two possibilities, when you mix and match, you get metal with a metal, non-metal with a non-metal, and then the mixture, non-metal with a metal, you get the three primary different materials that we have uh, available to us in this corner of the galaxy, and then we can use it to build all kinds of things. So it's kind of cool that um, our, all the things we're studying sort of boils down or breaks down to these three different categories, again, three being a magic number, and we can study them one at a time and in depth. So with that, um, sorry for uh, explaining all of chemistry and all of the known universe when it comes to materials in one little, one little sitting, but that's what we had to do. And uh, hopefully you're raring to go. We're going to be start talking about our individual materials in a little bit. And then we're going to see how we can build things, specifically how we can use additive manufacturing with our 3D printers and test them. And then hopefully have a, have a little bit of fun making some stuff. Welcome to the end of Module 1. Hope you survived. Talk to you soon. Thanks.